So, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome, please, for Michael Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hopefully, I have the Panopto working okay, so all the recordings all good. Uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I only just came to Cork back in October and just started here at UCC in January, so I'm very, very new here, uh, but I'm having a great time, and I'm really happy that you invited me uh, to come talk to you all. Uh, so this is when I now have to admit to all of you in the room that despite being an astronomer with a PhD in astronomy, I have never once used a telescope to do science. <laughs> All of my science is done using things like that up there, uh, supercomputers, large computers where we can run big simulations of the universe to learn about how galaxies evolve and other things like black holes, stuff like that. Uh, so. My goal today is to introduce you to this kind of field of astrophysics that you may not be as familiar with, of using computer simulations, why we do them, uh, what kind of things have we learned, uh, and how do they play a role in our sort of overall understanding of galaxies and the universe. Uh, so I'll start with some observations. So this video right here is uh, real galaxies. So these are real pictures of galaxies taken by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And we're kind of flying through the universe right now. All these images have been placed uh, based on their three-dimensional position in space. Uh, so obviously we're, we're not actually, this isn't how we actually see the world. But if we could fly around the universe at these speeds, this is what things would look like. So we've detected a ton of galaxies in the universe. Uh, and all of these galaxies look different. They have you know, different colors, different morphologies. They exist in different environments. You might notice that there's some structure here to the universe, this cosmic web where you have regions where there's a lot more galaxies and some regions where there's less galaxies and you have filaments and nodal points and all that. And so our overall goal in extragalactic astronomy is to understand why galaxies look the way they do. What aspect of their history, of their environment, of their internal processes and external processes uh, made them look how they look to us today and also across cosmic time. And that's a big challenge, right? There's a lot of galaxies there. And as I'll, as I'll point out later, we really only have a snapshot of what these galaxies look like in time. Right? So if we zoom out a bit and look at that same data, uh, same observational data, and, and uh, sort of put all those galaxies that we see with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey in space, we can see quite clearly that there is this structure to the universe, this cosmic web. We have regions of these filamentary structures where galaxies lie along these kind of lines in space. Uh, and we have regions there, there's lots of dense galaxies, these galaxy clusters that exist in these nodal points where you have filaments kind of feeding these big, dense regions of where there's hundreds of galaxies. And we even have these voids where, well, there's just really nothing there or not very many things there. So there's lots of large-scale structure to the universe. And again, we want to understand why galaxies look the way they do, how they're affected by their place in this kind of large-scale environment. So with things like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we can see a ton of galaxies across the whole sky. Those are galaxies that are, relatively speaking, pretty close to us here on Earth. But if instead of using something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a ground-based telescope uh, located in New Mexico, actually, if we instead use something like the Hubble telescope and point something like a space telescope at one point in sky and just let it stare at the same black, blank piece of sky for many, many hours, we get something that looks like this. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And so what we're seeing here is that if we point a powerful telescope at a point in the sky that looks dark, right? if you just wait long enough to collect all your photons, Right? You'll see that even the darkest point of sky is incredibly rich with a ton of 
things, it's a ton of galaxies that we can see. And these galaxies are, a lot of them are incredibly far away, which is why they're so dim and take something like the Hubble Space Telescope staring at them for a long time to see, right? But, of course, we know that light takes a finite amount of time to travel, right? So these galaxies in this image, which are billions and billions of light years away, are also billion, we're seeing those galaxies as they were billions and billions of years ago. So we're seeing light after it traveled for all that time to finally reach us here on Earth. So really, these are galaxies that are far away, but also galaxies that existed a long, long time ago. And if you have a trained eye uh, and can you know, stare at this image for a really long time, you can pick out some of these red little blobs in this image. All these red little blobs, which might not look particularly impressive, they might not have your, your big spiral arms or anything like that, these are ancient galaxies from when the universe was not even a billion years old. Okay? So images like this are incredibly important because we can see these galaxies, the universe, as it was a really long time ago when, it, when the universe was still very young. Okay? And we're getting even better at seeing this, right? This was the Hubble telescope. This is old. This is basically, you know, who cares about this? Now we have JWST. And when JWST looks at a point in the sky, we see even more detail. And this is not the same exact feel as the one I just showed, uh, but is the James Webb Space Telescope as it sees the point in the sky after a very short amount of time compared to the Hubble Deep Field. So with a fraction of the time, our current telescopes can see even deeper, even more detail, even more galaxies. And in fact, JWST is observing some of the earliest known galaxies we've ever seen. So these are a few examples of, again, they might just look like smudges, but these are galaxies that existed when the universe was less than half a billion years old. So we're seeing galaxies further and further back in time. Okay, And again, our goal in extragalactic astrophysics is to understand how are galaxies evolving over time? How do these galaxies, how might these galaxies evolve to become the things that we see today with, say, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or even uh, with your own telescopes in the sky? Right? And so, you know, to put it a different way, right, we can, we can take all these different snapshots of galaxies at different times and our question is how do we connect these dots together? How do we connect these galaxies through time to understand how individual galaxies evolve and change? But this is incredibly challenging, right? Because all of these images here are of different galaxies at different places and at only an instant in time, right? These galaxies evolve on time scales that are hundreds of millions of years, right? Much, much longer than even humanity has existed for. And so we can't just look at them and see how they're changing. All we get are snapshots of different galaxies at different places at different times. And so I like thinking of it like trying to understand how an individual human grows up over time, just looking at portraits of families at different times, at different places, uh, and trying to, to connect the dots. How do individual humans grow up? It's difficult to do if you can't just watch it happen. Okay, so this is the challenge. Uh, how, do we, how do we connect these dots? And that's exactly where simulations come into play. Because unlike observations, when I can look at a galaxy and I only see a single object at a single place at a single time, with simulations, we can look at, we can actually watch galaxies evolve over time. So this is an example of one of these simulations of a single galaxy evolving from the very early universe, when it was just a few tiny galaxies uh, merging together, uh, and growing up over time, you'll start to see something that looks more and more like what you typically think a galaxy looks like. So here we're looking at gas in kind of the teal color. Uh, we're looking at stars in purple and red, so new stars and old stars as stellar populations age over time, and even some black holes there, uh, supermassive black holes in the galaxy and wandering about. Uh, and so uh, now we can see this galaxy starting to look like a more spiral galaxy. You can start to see that rotation there. And so we can do something that we can't typically do with observations. We can watch a galaxy grow up in real time. And then 
at different points in time, compare that galaxy to observed galaxies, to real galaxies in the universe, to help us connect those dots together, help us understand how do these pictures of, of different galaxies connect and form a, a story of how galaxies evolve over time. And you know, how do these merger events that you see happening affect the galaxy? How do internal processes affect the galaxy? How does envi its environment affect it? All of those things we can learn from these simulations. And of course, simulations give us a different perspective of the universe, right? We can see different angles, and we can see different things. We can look at dark matter, which is usually, by definition, invisible to us. And we can look at gas on large scales. We can look at explosions happening within galaxies. We can see things that are typically invisible to us, and we can rotate and, and go around from different angles to get the full picture of all that's happening in one of our simulations because we have that power, right? We, we have the ground truth at our fingertips and we can, we can see it from all sorts of different, different angles. And so we can connect things that might be more difficult to connect with observations, these invisible parts of the universe, the large-scale gas, the dark matter that we might not actually be able to see even with powerful telescopes. We can connect those things to the things we can see the galaxies, the gas within galaxies, the stars, all that. So with simulations, right, we can follow individual galaxies through time, and we can also, again, have this privileged view of the universe, right? We can, we can see things that we normally wouldn't necessarily be able to see. So what actually goes into making one of these simulations? So the first ingredient you need is cosmology. You need an idea of how the universe evolves over time. This is something that we've known since uh, Hubble's day, that the universe is expanding. It's changing over time. We can see this expansion by observing galaxies moving away from us. Right? By detecting the relative velocities of galaxies in the universe, we can calculate how the universe is expanding and how that expansion has changed over time. Right, but Hubble looked at this in the kind of local universe, looked at the current expansion rate of the universe. But with powerful telescopes, like the space telescopes that I talked about, right, we can see galaxies across the whole history of the universe. And we can look at how the universe is changing, how the universe is expanding over all that time. So we can see how the universe changes, and we can put that idea into our model. So we have our cosmology, how the universe goes from the Big Bang to today, how it expands over time. But of course, you need stuff to put in your simulation. What is the universe made of? In this case, we actually kind of get a little bit lucky. So since the 80s, actually the, the 70s really, we've been observing this peculiar thing. If we look at galaxies like this, and we look at how stars and gas in those galaxies rotate, right? The velocity of those stars and gas is much faster than we'd expect, right? If we calculate how much gravity there is holding a galaxy together, and we look at how fast a galaxy is rotating, it's rotating way too fast. And so in order for that galaxy to be held together, there must be a lot more stuff than what we see, right? This was the most... Uh, the first and probably the most uh, direct evidence for dark matter, the fact that there's a lot of invisible stuff in the universe that makes up galaxies that we can't see, but is gravitationally attractive and is binding galaxies together. And in fact, if we make a little pie chart here of what the universe overall is made out of, the majority of the universe is made of this stuff called dark energy that goes back to that cosmology point that's what, what's causing the universe to expand at different rates. Uh, so dark energy, cool, that all how the universe is evolving. But in terms of the stuff in the universe, dark matter is dominant over normal matter, right? So dark matter is about five times more prevalent than the stuff that you and me are made out of, okay? So dark matter is the dominant thing in the universe and the dominant thing in individual galaxies. And so when we think about a galaxy like this here, Really, this is just the tip of the iceberg of what a galaxy actually is. Because in reality, this is just a teeny tiny point in the middle of a big structure that we call a dark matter halo. 
right? A bunch of dark matter surrounding this galaxy that's holding it together and is really the thing that's dominating its evolution, right? Most of the gravity that's affecting this galaxy is this huge dark matter halo surrounding it that's invisible to us, but is, again, dominating in terms of mass and in terms of size. So the majority of the universe is made of this dark matter, which is actually kind of nice uh, because dark matter, again, really only interacts gravitationally with things. Uh, and that's actually pretty easy to simulate. So that's kind of a win for us. So we have some stuff. Let's say dark matter for now. We'll get to the other, the other matter later. We have dark matter. We have our cosmology, how the universe evolves over time. The next thing we need is what do we start with? What is the initial condition of the universe, right? And that we get from observations again, the cosmic microwave background. So this is an image of essentially how the universe was about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So if we take a radio telescope and we just collect photons, we see that there's actually all this radio photons all around us. The universe is surrounded by this light that's left over from just after the Big Bang. This light maps out what the universe looked like in terms of its temperature and density. Right, so this is essentially a temperature map of the universe where these red areas are areas that are a bit hotter and the blue areas are areas that are a bit colder. But the important thing is that these represent density fluctuations in the universe, areas that are just a little bit denser or areas that are just a little bit less dense. This is essentially the seeds for all the structures in the universe in the cosmic microwave background. Right? So we have essentially a way, a map of what the universe looked like before there were stars, before there were galaxies, before there was anything but basically a soup of protons and neutrons and electrons. So with all this together, Right, we have our physics, our expanding universe, our cosmology, and gravity, which is what dark matter cares about. And we have our initial conditions. And so now we can start doing science and running a simulation. So we can use that, cos that cosmic microwave background, and we can use that to essentially populate a cube of the universe. We take a cube, some volume of the universe, and we populate that with matter, with particles, you know, that have a mass and a position and a velocity. Uh, and we populate that according to how matter is distributed in the universe, according to the cosmic microwave background. Nearly homogeneous, but not quite. And then we let it go and let physics do its thing. Let it go. There we go. Right? And so as gravity acts in our simulation, right, we know how gravity works very well. Two things are attracted to one another, GM, uh, times m time over r squared, right? Gravity is something we know well since Newton's time. Uh, that's all we do. And we, we let things evolve, let gravity attract. And these initial small perturbations in the universe create all the structure that we see and that we saw in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the galaxies uh, that we actually observe in real life. All of this is done, again, purely from initial conditions and gravity, which we know well. And assuming that the universe is made up mostly of dark matter, and we can ignore all the more complicated things for the time being. And so this is what one of these simulations looks like on large scales. We can, we're getting really good these days at running these simulations. We can run huge volumes of the universe in incredible detail. And this is what the universe looks like on very large scales. This is the cosmic web. Uh, this is from a simulation called the Millennium Simulation run Ooh, actually, I think it might have been like 10 years ago now. Uh, so this is what the universe looks like. It's, it's almost the same anywhere you look, but you see all this rich structure here. And again, this all looks a lot like what we saw in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this cosmic web structure of the universe. Again, this was done without any assumptions here, just gravity and those initial conditions that we get from observations. And so why does this happen? Why do we get this filamentary structure? Uh, well, it's because the universe doesn't work in nice symmet symmetrical ways, right? If the universe was filled with nice spherically symmetric things, then everything would collapse in nice spherically symmetric ways. 
But all those density perturbations, all those initial structures in the universe that seeded all of this were not exactly spherical, were not exactly nice. And so when you think about how gravity works, if you have something that starts out a little bit less than spherical, you'll get collapse in different directions at different rates. So you'll first collapse in one direction and go from something that's maybe roughly spherical to something like a pancake. And then that pancake will collapse in another direction to form a filament. And then that filament will finally collapse into the third direction to form a dark matter halo. Right? And what you're seeing in the cosmic web is the universe at different stages of this. And while we mostly see those halos and those filaments, if I gave a 3D picture of this, we could actually pick out sheets of matter in the universe, pancakes, if you will, of, of structures in the universe that, that lie along these cosmic sheets. Uh, and what's really interesting is that these simulations, again, without any fancy assumptions or fancy physics, was able to predict something really interesting. If you look at one of these simulations and you look at the structure of dark matter in each of these halos, in each, each of these objects that are, that are basically hosts to a galaxy, you find that all of them have the same structure. So look at the density of dark matter as a function of radius. Every dark matter halo in the simulation can be described by the same functional form. They have slightly different concentrations and sizes and masses, but they're all described in essentially the same basic way. And what's even more intriguing is that, again, without any tuning or anything like that, these can naturally describe the velocities of galaxies that we see. These profiles of dark matter, the distribution of dark matter that these simulations predict, just right out of the box, is able to correctly predict the mass distribution you need to get galaxies with circular velocities, with rotation, just like we see in the real universe, which is fantastic. So already we have, with a simulation of just dark matter, just gravity, starting with those initial conditions, we can extract now the structure, the large-scale structure of the universe, and we can even see the individual structure of dark matter halos and that make up most of the mass of the galaxies that we see today. And, of course, because it's a simulation, we can follow the evolution of all of this structure through time. And what we find is that the universe forms in a way that's hierarchical. Every galaxy, every dark matter halo in the universe forms as a result of mergers of smaller objects. Right? So you don't just have a single galaxy or a single dark matter halo accumulating mass over time. You have complex merger histories of smaller dark matter halos, smaller galaxies merging together to form something bigger and bigger. And with simulations like this, we can understand the different and varying merger histories that galaxies have, understand how their environment plays a role in how quickly they grow, how quickly their dark matter halos grow, at least. And if we assume that you know, dark matter and galaxies grow more or less together, we can begin to get a picture of how galaxies must grow over time and how galaxies merge and assemble their mass over time and in different environments. Right? So even with relatively simple simulations, in terms of the physics at least, we can learn a lot. But this is all dark matter. This is all stuff that we can't actually see. So how can we relate dark matter, how can we relate a simulation like this to the galaxies that we see in, say, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or you know, in any telescope on Earth? So for this, we can start with a relatively simple assumption. We can say, OK, well, we have all these dark matter halos. We know that they have a galaxy in them. If bigger galaxies exist in bigger dark matter halos, that stands to reason. Uh, it actually has some observational uh, backing to that as well. If we think that more massive galaxies are hosted by more massive dark matter halos, we can try to form kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence, essentially a function that goes from dark matter halos to observed galaxies. Okay? And we can do this by looking at some of the statistics of the simulation that we have. So we can take one of those big simulations and we can just count up the dark matter halos. We can p calculate the, the number of dark matter halos per unit volume as a function of their mass. We get something that looks like that. 
okay, great, we just took our simulation, we counted. But then we can look to observations. And we can do the same thing there, but for galaxies. So this, because we're dealing with magnitudes, which I think some of you are aware of already, uh, we're looking at bright galaxies on the left and dim galaxies on the right. But we can look at the same thing. The number density of galaxies is a function of their brightness, or you can also think of that as a function of their mass. Bigger galaxies have more stars, they're brighter. And we can say, all right, well, if galaxies and dark matter halos kind of exist in some way where you know, bigger galaxies exist in bigger halos, then we can say, all right, well, if I have a galaxy with this number density, it must exist in a dark matter halo such that it has a similar number density. Okay, so I can basically do what's called abundance matching. I can find abundances of galaxies, and I can match them to dark matter halos with the same abundance. And this is something that we've done for a few decades now, and it's yielded some really interesting results. Because if we do this, and we can do this in more complex and smart ways to, to be relatively realistic, we can calculate the dark matter halo mass of galaxies. Right? We don't see the dark matter, we simulate it, and then we relate those, those simulations to observations. And so we can make things like this. This is something called the stellar mass halo mass relation. The rela it relates the, the mass of a galaxy in terms of what we can see in terms of its stars to the dark matter halo mass that we infer using simulations. Now we get something interesting here. Because if every dark matter halo forms galaxies in the same efficiency, Basically, uh, you know, bigger dark matter halo forms a bigger galaxy, turns a bigger portion of its stuff into stars, then we should see kind of a, a straight line like that, like those two lines up there. Either it turns everything into stars or it turns some constant fraction of its mass into stars, but we don't see that. We see this kind of curved line here. And what that tells us, if we plot it in a different way, if we plot it in terms of the fraction of mass galaxy mass divided by the mass of its halo as a function of the dark matter halo mass, if every dark matter halo in, the, in our simulations formed a galaxy, formed stars at the same efficiency, then we'd expect a straight line at a constant value. But we don't see that. What we see is galaxies form stars in different ways. That a galaxy forming in a small dark matter halo forms very differently than a galaxy in a more massive dark matter halo. And that somehow there's this kind of sweet spot where you have this nicely efficient forming galaxies at this particular mass range, and then things begin to fall off again, and you get worse at forming stars and worse at forming galaxies. And so what this is telling us is that we need some more physics here, that we can't understand galaxies purely from dark matter, right? Because there's a lot something else must be going on that is more important than just the mass of a dark matter halo to determine what a galaxy looks like, to determine how a galaxy evolves over time. In fact, we can see this even more if we look at the details of some of the dark matter simulations that we have. So if we zoom in really far into one of these simulations of dark matter in the universe, we can zoom in on an individual dark matter halo and in this particular case, this is a dark matter halo that, based on those abundance matching, things that we just, we just talked about, is what we'd expect to be the dark matter halo of our Milky Way, more or less. What we see is a ton of rich structure here. It's not just a single halo, but there's a whole bunch of smaller halos inside of there orbiting around and, and all that. So there's a ton of this, what we call substructure, of dark matter. You don't just have individual dark matter halos, you have a bunch of satellite dark matter halos as well, and a ton of them, in fact. And this is actually a result of the fact that gravity behaves in this kind of scale-free sort of way. In the universe, in the gravitational universe, in dark matter, in the world of dark matter, big things and small things look the same, just scaled up, kind of like a fractal. Right? The, a bigger galaxy looks just like uh, a scaled-up version of a smaller galaxy. And we can see this if we look at an example of a galaxy cluster in dark matter versus a Milky Way in dark matter. Those are very similar structures there. 
it's, I would be very hard pressed to tell which one was which if there wasn't a label. All that's different is the scale. The one on top is bigger in mass and in size. But again, like a fractal, it's just a scaled up version of the smaller thing. But unfortunately for us, the real universe doesn't look that way. In the real universe, a galaxy cluster looks super rich with all these massive galaxies around. Uh, and the Milky Way-like galaxy looks rather lonely. Maybe a few satellite galaxies here and there. We don't see basically a mini cluster of galaxies around the Milky Way, nor do we see them around our own galaxy. And so all this points to the fact that if we really want to understand where galaxies come from, we need a bit more physics than just dark matter. And so that's where we start thinking about galaxies. How do we actually simulate galaxies in the universe. We got dark matter down, we can figure out the structure of the universe, we know where most of the matter is, but now we care about the details. What's going on in these galaxies that are at the center of these dark matter halos? So what do we need for galaxy formation? Well, we still need gravity, we still need dark matter, dark matter still makes up most of the universe, gravity is still the most important force on these scales, it's still what holds galaxies together, so we still gotta have gravity. But now we've got to add in regular matter, not just dark matter. Dark matter is nice, it's simple, only cares about gravity. But now we've got to add in gas. So we've got to have hydrodynamics. Right? Gas interacts in more complicated ways. Gas cools, gas heats, gas does more interesting things. So we need hydrodynamics in our simulations. But then as that gas cools and falls onto a galaxy, we need prescriptions for star formation. We need actually to model the formation of stars in the dense gas, right? We know from our own observations within our own galaxy, we can see these star forming regions where we're, we're seeing stars being born from gas. So as gas in our simulations get dense, we need to allow those stars to form in the simulation. So we need a model to form those stars. But then once those stars form, uh, they're not done. Then they start exploding. Right, so now we have to have physics of things like supernova explosions going off in our galaxies, injecting energy into their environments, and sometimes producing crazy cool outflows like in the movie right there. All right, so star formation, and then how stars interact with their environment through these supernova explosions. And then finally, my personal favorite, supermassive black holes. So every galaxy, including our own galaxy, our own Milky Way, has a supermassive black hole, a black hole that's millions or billions of times the mass of our sun. And that black hole can grow from eating gas around it. And as black holes grow, they also, just like supernova explosions, release a ton of energy into their environment. So down here is an example of one such galaxy that's been observed That's an observation of a galaxy undergoing incredibly powerful outflows driven by a supermassive black hole. And there we have a nice simulation of, uh, of one of those black holes on the right there. So these black holes are also important for in injecting energy into their environment. So great, we have our gravity, we have our gas physics, and then we have this more complicated star formation, supernova, black hole stuff. Uh, but that's, that's the physics that we need, more or less. Uh, and then of course we need our initial conditions which is, again, the cosmic microwave background as before. So we really have the same setup as before. We just added in some extra physics. We don't just have gravity. Now we have all this complex stuff, the hydrodynamics, the star formation, the supernova explosions, all of that stuff. And, but we still put all of our stuff in the universe, all of our gas, all of our dark matter, can still be put into our box in the same way, can still be... Uh, evolved, right? once we put all the physics in, we just let things go. And I'm using the same simulation here because really on large scales, things don't change too much. Right? This cosmic web structure is still the same. Most of the universe is still dark matter. What's different though is that now in these simulations, when you have these dark matter halos forming and merging and growing, you also have a galaxy growing and merging and all that at the same time. Right, so we can do both and follow both. And so a result of these simulations is a whole universe of galaxies. Galaxies that are forming naturally in this cosmic web structure 
over time as the universe expands and gases, cooling onto galaxies, onto dark matter halos, and falling towards the center, forming a galaxy. You have galaxies in different environments, galaxies that look different, galaxies with different colors, different morphologies, just like we saw in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And we can look at those galaxies, look at all their nice morphologies, and study them, not only how they look and compare them to observations, but how they evolve and change over time. Right? So we can make nice pictures of our galaxies uh, to kind of classify them as different things. Uh, but we can even be a bit more detailed and try to, to observe our simulation as if we were looking through a telescope. So we can do something like make what we call mock images. So we can you know, take our knowledge of how, say, the Hubble Space Telescope works, and we can use that to create fake images from our simulated galaxies and pretend that like, we're seeing a galaxy through the Hubble telescope and compare directly to observations. Right? How would this small galaxy and the early universe look if we, was look, if we were looking through the Hubble telescope or if we were looking through JWST? So we can make these observations, these fake observations, and then compare to reality. And we can learn about how things look the way they do and why. And just to give a nice little movie here of how some of these simulations work. And we can look at the different scales of some of these forming galaxies. So we're seeing here a galaxy in, in this, one of these big simulations forming over time. On the le bottom left here, we're looking at dark matter, uh, and I guess gas too, on large scales. So the large scale structure of the universe. Uh, and then we're seeing the smaller scale of the galaxy. We're now flipping around, looking at it from different angles, looking at different properties of the gas. Uh, actually, I think we're looking at the, something called the metallicity of the gas. Don't worry about that. But on the bottom right, we can see the detailed image of the, gal of the galaxy in terms of its gas, and also in terms of its stars on the left. So, and again, at every point in time, we can relate what's going on on large scales to what's going on in the galaxy and how this would create a galaxy that looks a certain way to an observer, right? And we can understand why things are the way they are. What happens when there's a merger? What happens when you get a particular burst of star formation? When does a disk form and why? All those things we can track through time using uh, these simulations. I think this movie is just about done. I wanted to get to the end of it so I can get to the credit scene. Uh, but. Yeah, nice little disk galaxy. Oh, there we go. There's a nice, oh, just ended right at the merger. Okay, there we go. This was done by the illustrious TNG simulation. Uh, they do some really good visualizations. Uh, okay, so that's awesome. This is great stuff. But the challenge here is one of dynamic range. Our biggest challenge with simulations is just the, the scale of the universe and the different scales in which things are happening. Right? So here in this movie, we can see that you know, this large scale universe is dictating a lot of the growth and evolution of this galaxy. Uh, but it's actually really, it's really bad. It's really hard. Right? If you think of the actual observable universe, the observable universe is tens of billions of light years large. An individual, say, dark matter halo that we can pick out from one of these simulations is of order hundreds of thousands of light years. But then these tiny little satellite dark matter halos that we also care about are of order hundreds of light years. But we just said we care about all this extra physics, star formation, black holes. All that stuff takes place on scales of light years or even light hours, light days. Right? So that's, if I did my math right, that's about... 14 orders of magnitude in scale. And we're trying to simulate physics taking place on all of those scales, the large scale structure of the universe, how that's evolving over time, all the way down to where stars are forming. And that's actually not possible. We can't do all of this all at once. And so this is what I like to think of as the dirty little secret of simulations, what we call subgrid models. So that nice simulation that we saw of galaxies forming. This is an example of a simulated galaxy. So in a simulation, similar to the screen on my computer or the screen on your TV, we have a resolution limit. And we have essentially a pixel size. 
usually in typical simulations, this is of order tens to maybe even thousands of light years in size. The smallest scale that we can say that we resolve in our simulation. And so this is essentially like a pixel of gas, which has a certain average temperature and average density. This is as small as we can know in our simulation. We can't go beyond this. And so what we need to do, a lot of the work that I do and lots of simulators do, is come up with models to relate properties of gas on the simulation at these smallest resolved scales to things like how fast is stars forming in this region. But given a certain temperature and density of gas, how much should I be forming stars in the simulation? And then how many, how many supernova explosions go off? And when those supernova explosions go off, how do they transport energy into their surroundings? Through a process called, we call this feedback. As you form stars, you transfer energy back into your gas, back into your surroundings. Similarly, if we look at the center of our galaxy, we might say that there's a black hole at the center of the galaxy, and we need to come up with models to relate the properties of the gas to the accretion rate, the growth of our supermassive black hole. And then, of course, if our black hole's growing, it's releasing a bunch of energy, just like supernova, and we come up with models to say, all right, how does that energy get transported to its environment? Right? And so these models get very complex and uh, can be, have a lot of, say, knobs that we can tune. And so a lot of our job as simulators is comparing our simulations to reality and fine-tuning them, right? Realizing where are our physics doing well, where's our physics doing bad? And this is just one example of such a thing where we take a, sim take a couple simulations. So in this case, you have a red simulation here, and you compare that simulation to a bunch of different observations. Don't worry too much about it. We have the star formation rate of the universe as a function of time. We have the mass of black holes as a function of galaxy mass. We have the number density of galaxies as a function of their mass, and we have the gas fraction of galaxies. Just different things that we can observe in the real universe, and we can see how does our simulation compare. And in this case, the red simulation does okay on some things, uh, but you can see it deviates away from those points, which are the observations. And so you go back, and you, f you look at where your model can be improved, and you improve your model, you do it again, and you get something that looks much better. And there's this iterative process. As we get better and better observations, we can refine and tune our models to be more realistic, and we get better galaxies, and we can, we can go from there and learn more and more as time goes on. So I just want to, to talk a little bit about what we've already learned from simulations. And I want to go back real quick to this idea of relating galaxies and their dark matter halos. Right? So we had this image of that small dark matter halos are really bad at forming stars. They're really bad at forming massive galaxies. And the reason from simulations that we now know is the case is that if you have a tiny galaxy and you start forming stars, you start exploding a bunch of supernova and you drive super powerful outflows. So because your, your dark matter is so small, you don't have a lot of mass holding you together. And so these supernova explosions can drive your gas to really large distances. So this movie here is basically a galaxy, as it's forming stars, just blowing away its gas. So you can never really get a good, sort of consistent star formation going on in these tiny galaxies, because you, if you form a star, you'll just start blowing away your gas from supernova. Now, as your galaxy, as your dark matter gets more massive, it gets better and better at holding on to itself. And so supernova become less good at blowing stuff away, and you get bigger and bigger galaxies. As you go to the right on this plot, your galaxy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Eventually, you reach this maximum point, which happens to be actually what the Milky Way is, roughly. And then things turn over again. And that would be because of black holes. Big galaxies also have really big, supermassive black holes, and they start to take over. So you're, you're more massive, you can hold on to yourself really well, and just as you thought you were going to start forming a bunch of stars, now you have this giant black hole blowing you up. And that's basically how the universe works. But the, the overall gist is, is that by modeling all these different processes, we can get a handle on all the important internal things that are going on in galaxies that shape their evolution, that shape 
why galaxies have a certain mass, why big galaxies don't form stars very fast, why small galaxies don't form stars very fast, and all that stuff. But we can only do that with these types of simulations. And so uh, simulations kind of come in all shapes and sizes, but the, the overall challenge, again, comes back to that scale. If we want to get a nice statistical sample of galaxies to compare to all of our observations of, of thousands, millions, actually, of galaxies, uh, we have to run a big volume of the universe in order to get all of the different environments, all the different galaxies, the common things, the rare things, all that stuff. But if you run a big volume, you can't get as good a resolution. And so there's this constant struggle between what you can resolve and how big your simulation is. And you're basically limited by computational power, basically. And so the one other thing we can do is we can find a galaxy that we like and we can trace it all the way back in time. I'm basically running the simulation in reverse here, and I can trace the, a galaxy in one of my big simulations all the way back to the beginning. And what I can do is I can cut out this little region of the universe that will one day be my favorite galaxy, and I can put all my computational power that at one time I was using to model the whole universe into just this tiny single galaxy, and I can run it again at much higher resolution. So just as an example for my own research, right, one thing that I'm very interested in is the mergers of black holes. And a lot of black hole mergers, a lot of supermassive black hole mergers, take place at early times and in small galaxies. So I can take my big simulation, I have a ton of galaxies, thousands of galaxies that go through all these mergers, and I can pick out some galaxies, I, I can resolve these galaxies, I know they exist, I know there's black holes, I know these two black holes, and those red X's are black holes there. I know those black holes in my simulation will merge, and I believe it. But those, those galaxies don't look very impressive. They're pretty blurry, pretty bad resolution. So what I can do is I can say, all right, well, well if I want to learn a lot more about these two black holes and how they evolve, I can zoom in to this galaxy. I can cut it out of my simulation, and I can re-simulate it at much higher resolution, and I can get something that's much more detailed now I don't have the statistics anymore, but now I have really fine detail of my galaxy and I can study that in different ways. Uh, so just one other cool thing we can do that I want to just point out with these, with these individual galaxies is we can actually do some cool experiments. Right? So I, I want to point this out because I, I feel like we often think that science experiments are done in the lab uh, or maybe even in observations. Uh, but we can do experiments numerically, too. Uh, so we can take some galaxy that we selected from one of our simulations. In this middle, that's what this middle movie will play. And we can manipulate the galaxy. We can change something about its history. So in this case, I have my galaxy. And I take a merger event. And I enhance that merger event. I make it bigger. I make it more happen a bit sooner, and it's a bigger event. And then on the left, I actually dial it down. I turn down the mass of the merger, make it smaller, make it happen later. And I can see, how does this change affect my galaxy? And beyond that, because I'm dealing with a smaller simulation, I can, get a, I can have a little bit more fun. I can mess around with physics. I can say, all right, what, what if I don't have any black holes? What if I ignore black holes entirely? I just have stars. I can see what happens to my galaxy, it's okay. I see a galaxy, still a disk, still blue and forming stars, more or less looks the same. But then if I add in black holes, I can see, oh, now I see a really strong difference. Now this merger event that I've changed has a dramatic impact on the evolution of my galaxy if I add in this extra physics. So I can dial my knobs in different ways, I can change my physics, and I can learn something about how the formation history of a galaxy interacts with the physics of the galaxy. In this case, how black hole physics interacts with, say, merger history of a galaxy to learn about it. So this is the kind of thing that we can do with simulations. We can get this more interesting, more full picture of galaxies and how they evolve. And now I'll just end with this idea that we're in really actually very interesting times right now. I mentioned JWST already, but the the data that we've gotten from JWST just over the last less than a year of actually getting data has been amazing. We've seen 
galaxies earlier than we've ever seen galaxies before. We've seen black holes earlier than we've ever seen them before in the universe. And so this is changing the game in terms of what we want to understand about the universe and how we can understand it. And so this is affecting simulations as well, because now we have whole new ways to test our models, whole new ways to study the universe, because we're seeing things that we've never seen before, which is really exciting. So I'm going to leave up my movie up here, uh, and I'll, I'll happily take any questions anyone has. Hope I didn't take too long. Hope you didn't all fall asleep. <laughs> Michael, thanks a million. That was absolutely mind-boggling. I'm not certain I followed every bit of it, <laughs> but the, the general thrust, it, it was absolutely mind-boggling. Um, maybe we'll start the questions and answers, or just start the ball rolling, and you actually referred to it at the very end. I thought you were going to answer my question in advance. Ah. The James West uh, Space Telescope very recently has seen more galaxies further back earlier in their evolution. And what they saw wasn't what they were expecting, hmm. because what they s expected to see was much smaller galaxies, because there wasn't enough time for them to merge, like you explained. But what they actually saw was much bigger galaxies, which kind of really upset their thinking. Maybe you could just give us uh, an idea on what the latest explanation or what the yeah. latest thinking on that is. Yeah, this actually is a pretty controversial topic here, this idea of uh, how big do we expect galaxies to get and how fast in the universe. And so, yeah, there were results that indicated that there were more massive galaxies than we expected. I think there's actually two, two things here. The first uh, is that one thing we're learning is our, the way we interpret observations can be complicated when you get to really early times. And so there's a lot of actually uncertainty in terms of how you go from collecting light to calculating how much mass that must correspond to. And so there's some uncertainty there that's caused some problems in the community about how, how big are they really, how certain are we, and how big are they. Uh, but I think that it, it has, it's definitely true that there are some confirmed quite big galaxies that we can believe. Uh, but it turns out, actually, we predict them in simulations. Uh, a collaborator of mine actually wrote a paper uh, showing that simulations predict very similar number density of relatively massive galaxies uh, at early times as JWST predicts. And so there's a bit of a controversy in the community about how much is this, you know, how much of our model is wrong versus how much of it is right, and we just never really looked into it. Um, I think bigger picture, you know, talking about on the simulation side, it's actually really difficult to resolve galaxies that early on in the universe. Most of the simulations that people use to compare to can't, they, they wouldn't even resolve any galaxies at that time. They're, they're too low resolution to, to do that. And so they're not actually equipped to, to make those predictions in the first place. And so it's pointing to the fact that we really need whole new simulations that really have a whole different focus than we've ever focused on before. Right? We typically want to explain galaxies today, but now it seems like we need simulations focused on really this early, almost first billion years of the universe to really understand things. So that's, that's my take. I think it's not as bad as people say, uh, but there is a lot we don't know, um, and a lot we actually can't learn just from the simulations that we have, because um, they're not built for it. Okay, excellent. Okay, let's throw it over to the control. John? Looking at this simulation, caught my eye the very first time, so these little white spots, these perfectly white spheres or circles, <laughs> yeah. you know? Is there something that would go counter, counter to the spin of the Milky Way? Or the, some, of, some of them are, some of them are, yeah. Some of them are. What are they? Are they, are yeah. they the stars that are closer to us? Is that what that's supposed to represent? I'm really glad you asked that question because it's actually a big part of my research is the dynamics of these are all supermassive black holes. Ah, right. And so one thing that we are able to predict with our simulations is that when galaxies merge together, a lot of times these two galaxies merge, they have black holes in their centers. Those black holes will find each other and merge and create a new black hole at the center of the galaxy. But lots of times when galaxies merge, they kind of leave their black holes behind 
and you get these wandering black holes on very large scales. And so they orbit the, uh, you know, on very large scales in the galaxy that will just you know, stay there forever and won't ever sink to the center. And so that's actually a new prediction that we've made in the last five years is trying to understand these, this population of these wandering black holes that we're predicting in these simulations. And we're kind of starting to see potentially observational evidence for, but they're really hard to detect observationally. But yeah, they're really interesting to look at, to think about. Uh, yeah, it's it's bound to the galaxy. It's bound to the dark matter halo. So it's it's you know gravitationally a part of the system. It's just orbiting it just like any other star is. Uh, if um, you can imagine it like uh, if I could actually s show you really low density stars in this movie, you might actually see you know as galaxies merge together, they leave their stars behind these kind of trails, and so you have this buildup of a stellar halo on large <coughs> scales. And so the black holes in this case would be just a part of that kind of extended halo of stars surrounding a galaxy left behind from you know a whole history of mergers and stuff like that. Just be a part of that sort of large orbits of things. Does that make sense? Well, when we leap forward in our understanding of the universe, do you have to reset the whole simulation again, or can you just enter in the data and move forward from there? No, yeah, so actually I, I meant to have a slide that shows it's, it's, it's very iterative process, right? So it's, um, you know, you run a simulation, and it, this is actually, uh, it is hard because the simulations are very expensive, and so you don't want to run something that's going to give you garbage results. Uh, so you have to be careful, you have to, you know, do some tests to see if you're going to get something that's reasonable. Uh, and then you, you run it and, and you go out what you get out. And when you learn from the observations that something is very wrong, you, you got to run it again. But it, it's that process. It's, you know, we use the simulations to interpret the observations we have. And then when new observations come along, we can compare it and we go, oh, something's, uh, something's wrong here. We do some work to try to figure out what's going on. We find it. We say, okay, we can explain this. It's like this. And then we can make a new prediction and say, and to prove it, try to look at this. And then the observations go out and they'll say, well, you're kind of right, but you're also kind of wrong. And then we have to go back. And it's a, it's a team effort and we do have to rerun it again. They're expensive uh, and it's hard. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I would say the physics in the early universe is just less well known. Uh, and the reason, the reason that is, is so the composition of the universe is changing over time. Right? Before any stars formed, the universe was more or less purely hydrogen and helium. And we still actually don't know for sure how stars form in such an environment. So things like how, how massive stars are in the very early universe, the very first stars might look very, very different from the stars that we see today. And there's a huge uncertainty in, in some of the models. How, how do these stars form? How big are they? How explosive are their supernova? Are they you know, emitting light and exploding in different ways? And so things like that can be very different. We don't know where black holes form. We don't know exactly how black holes form, where they should exist how they should be growing, how big they should be. So these are major uncertainties. And our, just our lack of observations in this time mean that we, we're kind of, we're kind of we, we have no constraints at the moment. Now, but with JWST, we might be getting some really interesting constraints that might help us kind of fine tune our model and test some things. But at the beginning, right, we, you know, you can make an assumption. If you, if you don't have anything to, to test it against, you can't know if you're right or wrong, right? So, that's, that's kind of where things get complicated. Not so much that the physics is, is different, but just unknown, untested, um, if that makes sense. Two, two of those questions, sorry. <laughs> How long does your average simulation run for? Yeah. And what sort of data size are you talking about? Oh, good question. So it depends on the simulation you're talking about. Uh, the big simulations that I've run in human time took about somewhere between six to nine months to run across about 10,000 computers uh, oh constantly through that time. Uh, so yeah, also big carbon footprint. So another reason to be careful with your parameters, make sure you're not going to run garbage. Uh, yeah, my advisor used to have a, a graphic 
talking about how many polar bears we killed per simulation, kind of, kind of dark, dark stuff. Uh, sorry, <laughs> now I got distracted. <laughs> Yeah, so we run these simulations on, on supercomputing clusters so they can run, uh, basically you have you know, tens of thousands of computers talking to one another. And our, our, the code that we use, you know, there's a whole lot of computer science side of, of this where we have code that you know, it's not trivial to, to scale code. So you have, you have to have computers that are simultaneously running and communicating with one another. And at some point, you're gonna run into an issue where if you have so many computers, your communication ends up taking more time than the calculation. So it's actually complicated, but we can actually run up to about half a million computers if we wanted to, if we could. Uh, but typically for the simulations that we're doing, yeah, I was running on a few tens of thousands of, of CPUs. Um, yeah. Uh, and then the data size, between several and tens of terabytes of data at the moment. Oh, yeah. is, there, is, there, is, is there a like a peer review process that works say, within the design side of sort of the simulations you're running? Is there some sort of checks or something like that? How do you uh, how do you actually know it's pretty accurate? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I mean we we publish, right? So you, you run a simulation, you publish the results, and the publication goes through a peer review process. Uh, the code itself is also public, uh, so people can actually look at it and 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 run things. Good way to find bugs, uh, but but yeah, it's it's hard to know like you know when you have the ground truth. All you can do is like analyze it, come up with the best results you can. Have it you know trust that you you know you give it to someone that will critique it enough, uh, and yeah, publish it, and then you say all right, yeah, well, this is believable at least. Uh, but yeah, that's the essentially the publication is the way things, the way things work there. Uh, I was just wondering, is it possible to, or maybe has it been done, to do a simulation of the Milky Way galaxy to figure out, you know, did life form here just, it's got no particular or significance why it formed here, or uh, is, did it form here because every other part of the galaxy would be more hostile to life? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, so people have run, people love to run simulations of the Milky Way. That's a big one because, in particular, looking at the, the small galaxies around the Milky Way, it's actually a big scientific area to understand the evolution of, of small satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. They're the ones that are closest. We can study them in, in great detail. And some people run simulations to understand them, as well as understand the Milky Way. There has been some work on this idea of a galactic habitable zone, if you will, uh, you can imagine there are a ton of processes out there that would be very hostile towards life. A uh, black hole in the center of a galaxy releasing a ton of energy, that's one. Uh, but even like a kilonova or a supernova going off nearby could easily kill all life on Earth. Uh, and so it's, it's complex to know where life could form most likely. Uh, the problem with all this is human life Actually, I'm not a paleontologist here, but it's been, been around for of order tens of thousands of years. Right? 100,000 years, tens of thousands of years. Yeah, so uh, for, for reference, a time step of the simulation here is about 10,000 years. Uh, so the time scale at which galaxies evolve is, is so immense that as far as humans have been on the planet Earth, the sun hasn't even gone through one rotation of the galaxy. Right? So... Yeah, it would be really hard. I couldn't even say if Earth is habitable for an infinite amount of time because, you know, for all I know, there's a supernova that's about to go off next door, you know? So, yeah, it's a complicated question, this idea of, of where life forms. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't form planets in the simulation, as I talked about, To That's a whole different scale simulation. So, yeah, we're not even at that level of combining those two things together. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, fascinating talk. Um, what simulations are going from the deep past up to the present? Are any simulations being run from the present into the deep future? Tens, maybe even hundreds of billions of years into the future to try to predict what the future structure, large scale structure of the universe might be? Yeah, I think the answer is. Honestly, weirdly enough, I've gotten a similar question in my class 
this, and I have a hard time answering it, because really, no, we don't run simulations in the future. And the reason being is simply that, again, the, the time scale for evolution is so long that we'd never be able to test it. Uh, and so really, the best we can do in terms of like what matters in the big picture is you know, people run simulations of like the Milky Way and Andromeda to see when will Andromeda merge with the Milky Way. So that kind of thing people do. But in terms of the, the, the larger sort of sim, uh, simulation, it, it's too expensive, and you couldn't actually test it to validate it. Uh, but you can say, you know, imagine what the universe as a whole does, and that really just is, is more simple, right? Like the universe we know is going to be expanding forever, and so you kind of have this heat death of the universe overall. So you can, you can get a big picture idea of what goes on, but yeah, people don't run simulations just because it's completely untestable. Oh, thank you. But it was a predicated policy given, you might just clarify. A dark energy halo is like a it's like a donut around around real matter, matter, whatever you call that. Uh, it almost sounds so it's compressing the stuff in, and yet it's. 80 or 90 percent of the mass of the whole lot. And I, I just think on the Earth, the, the heavy stuff, the gravity intense stuff, goes to the middle. So why doesn't dark matter go to the middle? And the less, you know, the less matter sort of a creep around the middle. So that would make sense if, say, dark matter was made of something very massive. So if dark matter was made of, say, big old black holes or something, then you'd get this kind of mass segregation. You get massive things sink to the center. Uh, now, be careful. There's different, different things at play here. So in terms of like, you know, something for, say, the Earth to have, say, iron in the center, in order for that to happen, you have to have a lot of heat. So that's kind of a, one thing to keep in mind here. You have to heat something up to get that kind of differentiation in terms of density. Uh, but I think in that the, the general answer to your question is that we don't know what dark matter is, uh, but we can place limits with stuff like that, right? If dark matter was very massive, it might act dynamically in a way that's different than what we observed. What we have observed is that dark matter is probably some particle that's more or less kind of evenly distributed. It's not very massive and it doesn't interact very strongly with anything. And so because of that, you won't get that kind of segregation of mass. It's not, say, denser than stuff. It's just there's more of it, right? It's not denser than iron or something like that. It's just there's, there's more of it around. Uh, and so you, you wouldn't get that same kind of segregation effect, if that makes sense. Um, but there are some people that do believe that dark matter is made of black holes. Uh, that would have different implications, and you can actually test those kind of things. So one thing I didn't talk about is we can actually run different models of dark matter, say pretending dark matter is a specific particle or interacts with itself in certain ways or has a certain temperature to it, and we can see how that affects galaxies. And we can, can kind of zero in on you know, which models are realistic and which ones are less realistic. Uh, the more realistic ones seem to indicate that dark matter is just some, some small particle that's weakly interacting, that's kind of evenly distributed everywhere, doesn't, that doesn't have this kind of yeah, sinking property that you're talking about. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, you have a limit, a limit, a limit, you can turn on that. There are force Is that to suggest that uh, space is limited? That whole oh, is limited. that is a really good question. That's a very good question. No, space is infinite. What, we, what is not infinite is what is our kind of observable horizon of the universe, right? So imagine it like this. You know, light has to travel from one position to another, right? And it has a finite speed. So as things are today, there's only a certain volume of the universe that we've been able to kind of interact with, that the light has been able to reach us. Uh, now that horizon does expand over time, right? As, as time goes on, more and more light from further and further reaches of the universe will, will reach us. Uh, over time, but there is a, a limit today. So, so the cosmic microwave background, that, that map we saw, is kind of the, the, the maximum reaches of our, of our current horizon, if you will. So it's the, the earliest light, and it's as far away as we can possibly see. 
but th there is a limit to that. But that is just a, it's a relativity thing. It's a, we can only see so far as light has had time to travel today. Um, now, interestingly, you might think that the size of the universe is just, if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, that the size of the universe is 13.8 billion light years, but that's actually not true because the universe expands and it doesn't expand, uh, it, it's not limited by the speed of light in its expansion. So the, the observable universe is something like, oh, I should have looked this up before this talk. Uh, something of order, I wanna say like 48 or 50 billion light years. So it's a bit weird that the universe is bigger than that, but like uh, it's because it's expanded since then. So we're seeing something as it was, you know, before it expanded further away from us, if that makes sense. Uh, so the ex observable universe is about, let's say, 50 billion light years in size. What? 46? Yes, that's pretty close. It's pretty close. In astronomy, as long as it's within a factor of 10, I'm good. <laughs> OK, that's it. That's perfect timing. Uh, we'll wrap it there.